This evening, we welcome uh, Dr. Luke Rendell, of the, who is a reader in the Department of uh, Biology in the University of St. Andrews. Uh, in his work, he has an affiliation with a number of organizations, and I hope he'll excuse me if I read them because they're so numerous. Uh, he's uh, the uh, Scottish Ocean Institute, the Sea Mammal Research Unit, the Center for Biological Diversity, the Center for Social Learning and Cognitive Evolution, and the Institute of Behavior and Neural Sciences. Among uh, his many publications is a book which he co-authored with Philip Hall called The Cultural Lives of Whales and Dolphins. And this has actually been the subject of a discussion on the BBC Radio 4 program Start the Week. Um, for, those, for those of you still anxiously wondering what to get loved ones in close Christmas presents, um, Luke has told me that it is still available in various sources including Amazon. And um, I don't think I'm getting any commission for that promotion, but I can live in hope. I <laughs> anyway, here to talk to us about the uh, impact of noise upon uh, marine life, Luke Rendell. Get my own here. Two slowly microphones. Yeah. Great, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Everybody hearing this microphone? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. good, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so, so this is me. I'm at the University of St. Andrews. I research uh, behavior um, and communication, local communication, largely of marine mammals. Um, and I teach um, uh, statistics, animal behavior, and bioacoustics uh, at, at various levels <coughs> at the university. Um, uh, but the topic I was asked to speak on today uh, is this one, the effects of noise on, on marine life. Um, that's obviously a broad uh, um, taxonomic group. Um, a lot of this is going to be marine mammals, but we are going to talk about fish and uh, invertebrates uh, a little bit, um, because it turns out that they, uh, there are also you know, quite significant issues around the effects of noise on, on, on those groups as well. There will also be some sounds, and I'll try and control the volume, but I'll warn you before they're coming, uh, so that if you are sensitive to sudden or loud noises, you can take some uh, protective or precautionary um, <coughs> uh, moves. Right. <coughs> so, uh, you know, we, we, we see the ocean from the surface. It's very easy to think of it as a peaceful, calm, and tranquil place, um, but, but it is not actually under the water there. Um, it's uh, a very busy and, and noisy place. So I've stolen this graphic from uh, National Geographic, and it sort of represents the, the challenges that we're talking about here. There's, there's two uh, right whales depicted here, and they're an endangered species in the, in the North Atlantic. Um, and they are trying to, one of them is trying to emit a sound that the other one, he wants the other one to hear. Um, for whatever reason, and this represents all the things that are possibly uh, getting in the way. Uh, some of those are natural, like uh, the fish, or uh, weather, um, or, or seafloor earthquakes and things like that. But some of them are generated by us and our activity, whether it's submarines down below, or ships uh, on the surface, and particular activities, for example, seismic surveys for uh, undersea uh, hydrocarbon fossil fuel deposits um, uh, introduce uh, noise into the environment. Uh, and this all affects the ability of these animals to uh, communicate with each other and find uh, each other. Um, <clears throat> so let's go on here. This is a slightly more complicated version uh, of the same sort of information. Um, <clears throat> we can talk about uh, the, the the duration of sounds and the spatial scale over which they might be um, uh, exerting effects. Um, and we go from everything from sort of uh, fish finders and, and, and uh, echo sounders down here. And in, in yellow are sort of our, our contributions and then the natural ones uh, are, in, are, are in blue. So we'll go through a bunch of these and you'll see them. But up here, um, the frequency or pitch is a very important concept when we're talking about sound, you know, low frequency, low pitch, and high frequency, and high pitch, we'll explore that a little bit. 
Um, but these uh, represent uh, the sort of frequency range over which different organisms in the sea uh, are actually making sounds and presumably then hearing them. And then these are the frequency ranges um, of the various activities uh, that we do that introduce noise into the marine environment. And so we have a very active and very uh, um, <clears throat> diverse uh, soundscape going on, okay? And this changes in different places. Uh, and um, <clears throat> So, for example, you don't get polar ice cracking in the tropics, for example, but you do get hurricanes uh, and, and things like that. <coughs> um, so here's a little pop quiz, okay? One of the things that, uh, that, mean that, that, that makes the effects of noise in marine environments particularly uh, um, significant really is the way that the sound travels in the ocean, right? So, if there was a blue whale vocalising in St Andrews or off St Andrews, uh, uh, and there was nothing in the way, how far do you think you could see it? Could you uh, hear it, right? Could you hear it in Dundee? Could you hear it in Edinburgh? Could you hear it in London? Could you hear it in Paris? London. Okay, we've got a London, we've got a Paris, right? The answer is Paris. Okay, um, obviously you wouldn't because Paris is on the land, but I mean, if you took the distances in the ocean, um, then that's, that's how far potentially you could hear um, a blue whale, right? So the point is that sound travels a long way in the ocean. It also travels approximately five times faster in water than it does in air, right? Which is why it's one of the um, most important sensory and communicative modalities in the ocean for animals that live in. <coughs> um, it has become increasingly recognized that uh, the state of the acoustic environment is an important part of our general environmental health. Um, and so in 2008, the EU's Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which I, I believe that we're still more or less following even after Brexit to some degree, uh, was adopted and it recognized underwater ocean noise as an ocean pollutant uh, for the first time in any kind of legal framework, right? So it's relatively recent that we have started to become aware of the importance of this issue. So I just want to take you through sort of four areas related to this. Okay, the first of all is like, well, what are, the, what are these noise sources and what do they sound like and, and, and things like that? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, well, okay, uh, what, is, what is the uh, perception that underlies the effects that might these, these noises might have on marine life, and what are, the, what are those impacts, okay? And then <clears throat> how do we, as, as researchers and, and uh, uh, scientists working in this area, try and assess now the impact of these, what these noises might be um, when we're thinking about planning our activities uh, in the ocean, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is a slightly complicated figure, uh, but it is a representation of all the non-anthropogenic uh, and non-biological sounds that we hear uh, uh, in the ocean, and it also has a little bit of ships and industrial activity. But what, what these lines represent is actually that the, 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 the noise levels uh, in the ocean can vary by um, what is no noted here as 20 dB, but because of the decibels are, are, are a funny thing, 20 dB actually represents a doubling. Um, because it's a logarithmic scale, I don't really want to get into that, but believe me, when I say that 20 dB rep actually represents a doubling of intensity, uh, and just having a sea state going from calm to 4-6 uh, uh, can actually double the amount of noise that's going on in, 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 in the ocean as well. So there's a lot of natural variation. I saw this myself when my student put sort of uh, uh, 10 listening devices down the east coast of Scotland, um, and correlated the, the, the sort of background noise level on those recordings with the uh, uh, weather systems going, going over. Basically, when it was stormy, everywhere was noisy, right? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, want to, uh, I want you to pay attention sort of to, to this particular frequency band here. This is 100 hertz. Um, and um, before our, us, there was a kind of notch in a lot of these noise frequency spectrums. Down here you get kind of seismic noise and, and low frequency stuff, and up here you get sea state and weather noise, and there's a sort of notch at around 100 hertz, um, which many whale species found over an evolutionary time and focus their sound production in that particular band. Um, and then, unfortunately, when we started producing motorized ships, that's pretty much exactly where 
the main frequency of, of ship noise hits. Right. So it's quite a big, uh, quite a big issue. <coughs> so let's talk about some of these naturally occurring noise sources. Okay. Um, let's see what this sounds like. Obviously, they're relatively rare, okay? Transient events. Um, <clears throat> lightning strikes. Close to it, that can also be very loud. ways of measuring rainfall in the ocean or over the ocean. If you do it in land, you just put a cup out in the middle and it's water comes up. Um, you can't do that in the sea, but if you put, you know, you can actually buy acoustic rain gauges which you can put out in the sea uh, and, and they will measure for you like how much precipitation is going on based on the acoustic signal that that rain gives. Um, <clears throat> we have obviously a lot of biological uh, sound sources. Um, we've got our, our classic uh, humpback whales um, up here. So you're probably going to have to listen quite carefully. There you go. Got some humpback song going on. whistles but also the sort of clacking sound is their echolocation which is part of their sensory biology. are actually their social communication. Uh, chatting to each other. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. This is um, what I've done a lot of study in my career on. Uh, this is a, a, a toadfish. Right. Uh, many fish species make sort of various variations of that type of sound, um, thought to be to sort of produce, uh, attract and find mates primarily. This is your, sna your classic snapping shrimp, which are all over coral reefs, shallow water, anywhere in the tropics. This sounds like frying bacon, right? So you can know them there. Um, and uh, this is one of my favourites. This is a this is actually a minke whale, not from these waters. They sound different in these waters, but they in the in the Pacific, uh, in the South Pacific, minke whales make these extraordinary sounds. It's been called the Star Wars sound. Um, um, <laughs> again, we don't uh, still trying to understand what what they're for, uh, but they make a lot of them. Uh, so so that's. Just, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I've got some of my sounds here. Just trying to advance the time. Uh, <laughs> right, bear with me. 
that we make uh, in, our, in, our, in, in the ocean, okay? Uh, so we have uh, the, the, one of the primary sources, which is our shipping. Uh, so that's a boat going by, okay? Uh, these are increasingly seen in the ocean, these wind turbines. Sound like much, but it's that kind of low rumble uh, going on in the background. Uh, uh, drilling. Um, and uh, okay, so so bear with me if you if you if you are feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the noise, you might want to block your ears with this one because this is active military sonar. Um, right. um, so that's a, a type of submarine hunting sonar called a 53 Charlie, um, which is um, deployed on, on um, NATO vessels. Um, <clears throat> and that's the unclassified version that we're <laughs> to, to, to play. Um, uh, we also have uh, these uh, seismic air guns. Um, so that's, that, that's what's going on here. Uh, this is a, a, a survey vessel, and it tows this kit behind us, and these air guns produce sound pulses, uh, which go down and, and, and uh, bounce off the seabed, and the, the echoes inform us of what's, what's below the seabed, and it's used to, to look for um, of, um, deposits of you know, fossil fuels. They'll go on every 10 seconds. They'll make one of these sounds and they'll just go on for hours and hours as they do these, these surveys. Um, sometimes we just straight up blow things up. <laughs> Obviously, quite noisy. Uh, and sometimes we actively try and use acoustics to deter animals from things like seals, uh, to deter them from, from fish farms where they might go and uh, actually take some. Uh, the fish off of there, so they sound a bit like this. That's that kind of sound that you can hear coming in and out. Okay, that's one example of a, an acoustic deterrent device. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of the things that's kind of really important to note, I've already said it, but these these travels, these sounds can travel quite a long way. And as they travel through that, the, the transmission properties of the sea sort of changes the nature of the sound as well. So this is a, 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 a recording of a, a, of a vessel pile driving. So that's kind of driving uh, foundational um, piles down into the sea on which some kind of structure, um, either a, a windmill or perhaps a harbour wall or something is going to be built, right? So if you, if you're, if you record that from 500 metres away, sounds like this. Bang, 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 right? Um, <clears throat> At eight kilometers, it sounds like this. Okay, you start to see that what, what, what happens is that um, low frequencies propagate better than high frequencies. So as you get further away, the sound gets lower. And also, you have this thing called multipath, which means that you know, as I'm talking to you, some of the sound you're receiving is coming direct from the speaker to you, but some of it is bouncing off the ceiling and then arriving, and some of it's bouncing off the back wall and arriving. We don't really notice it at this scale, but what you'll notice at 40 kilometers away, that multipath arrival results in a kind of smooshed smooshed out sound relative to the to the close one. So this is what they sound like at 40 kilometers. So lower frequency and also kind of a longer pulse because it's actually being made up of multiple arrivals, some of which are going direct, some of which are bouncing off the seabed, some of which are bouncing off the sea surface. Etc. Okay, <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, to the other uh, another source of uh, sound is just the interaction between the sea and land itself, or in this in, in coral reefs. Um, and this is a just a really interesting bit of data um, to show that larval stage uh, 
uh, coral reef fishes are actually uh, attracted to reef noise. Okay, so um, this is each of these pairs of bars is one family of fish uh, that has been collected in traps, and in the in the solid bars are traps uh, which have um, speakers next to them broadcasting just the noise of waves hitting a reef and uh, the snapping shrimp that occur on those reefs. Uh, and the, the wide bars are, are traps which have no such speaker next to them. And you, you can see quite clearly there's almost a, twice as many fish across many families being uh, caught in traps that have these reef noises. So, so, so fish, when they're in their pelagic larval stage, are using the noise of reefs uh, and islands to actually figure out where they should go and, and settle when they become their, their, their adult stage, right? So it gives you some idea of just how important sound is to life in the sea um, at, at, at all kinds of different taxonomic levels, okay? And <coughs> the oceans are getting noisier, and I'll show you the evidence for that uh, in a little bit, but it, there is no doubt that uh, as our industrial development has progressed, we have begun, we have continued to put increasing amounts of acoustic energy into the environment. Um, how do we know this? Well, uh, this graph here mm, uh, compares uh, on with the stars here. This is, this is noise levels uh, recorded uh, off um, Point Sur in, in California. Um, and the, the, this line here with the asterisks represents uh, noise levels that were recorded in the mid-1960s. Okay? And then this uh, solid line with this line with the triangles here uh, represents those same measurements made in the period between 1994 and 2001. So it's so 20 years ago, but um, in, the, in that period, in that sort of 30 year period, we see that, uh, say, for uh, 100 hertz or something like that, then there's been a, an almost 5 decibel increase in, in ambient noise levels at other frequencies, like 40 kilohertz there's been a, a 10 decibel increase in, in, in noise levels. Now, that might not sound very much, but uh, we have to remember the decibels are a sort of logarithmic scale, so 20 represents a doubling, okay? So 10 is a significant increase over that, over that period. Um, and, and it's largely because of shipping, okay? But that, that increases the credit. Our, our, our global uh, economy uh, drives it. How do we know that? Well, um, we can, have a look at what happened to noise levels uh, during the famous 2008 financial crash. Okay, <laughs> these are noise levels that were recorded um, uh, again in in California near the port of Los Angeles. So so largely affected by shipping coming in and out of Los Angeles, and you can see again a significant uh, five to ten decibel drop in those noise levels, coincident with the impact of the financial recession. So, so less trade, less economic activity, less noise uh, from shipping. <clears throat> to give you an idea of how pervasive this is, okay, um, this is, uh, I'm going to show you data from um, hydrophones that were moored in these locations along the mid-Atlantic ridge, right, so right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, six devices uh, were, were moored. And you get these recorders that you can put down and they will record continuously for months at a time and then you go and pick them up again and you have a sort of continuous acoustic record of what happened. Um, and during that time, um, the, the researchers were able to document that, um, you know, f find out that there were seismic uh, surveys going on off the coast of Africa, off the coast of Brazil, and off the coast of Nova Scotia in North America, those are those white dots going on there. So that's pretty far away, right? <laughs> We're looking at the entire North Atlantic here. Um, but this shows how the, the detection, or how many days, um, or, or the proportion of hours per month, right, in which pulses from these seismic surveys going off the coast of Brazil, the coast of Africa, and the coast of North America were detected in the mid-Atlantic ridge. Okay, and you can see that during the peaks of the activity between sort of May and November, you get almost up to 100%. Right? So in, in the mid-Atlantic ridge, you're detecting seismic surveys that are happening on the coast of Africa, the coast of Brazil, and the coast of North America, nearly continuously. Right? So we, we really are 
making a big impact on the, on the soundscape of the oceans. This is, this is what it kind of looks like, uh, one of these recordings, okay? And you get an idea of just how complex that soundscape can be. Actually picked up an earthquake happening, small earthquake point, so that was a transient but very loud uh, event. Um, in this recording, there's also a blue whale singing, and that's that <laughs> sequence here, okay? Just going in, completely drowned out by the earthquake. But then these vertical lines that you see going up and down there, that's your air gun pulses just continually going on um, in, in the background as well. And you can see by from this from this plot here, you know, the, the, the pulses of the of these air guns are exceeding the background noise level by by, by a significant amount. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> let's think about what effects then these these sounds are having when animals are receiving them. Okay. Um, so Let's do a little, little bit of an experiment. Um, the, the perception of whether noise is annoying or not to us depends very much on, on our own ears, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to play a recording that has two sounds, both of which are relatively annoying. Um, but I'd, I'd like you to, to, to put your hand up if you hear the second one, okay? That's the first one. And there's a second one. Did anybody hear this, the second one? Okay, put your hand up. Okay, um, <clears throat> not wanting to pick on you, madam, but there's something a bit different about you than most of the other people in this room, myself included. Okay, um, which is um, you're re you're relatively young. Okay, you, sir, if you heard the second one, you have remarkable ears. Um, in humans, our hearing starts when we are born. We can hear perhaps up to 20 kilohertz if we're lucky but it continuously and relentlessly degrades over life, okay? Which means that most of us were only able to hear the first pulse, which was at eight kilohertz, and we could not hear the second one, that was at 16 kilohertz, okay? Except for younger or extraordinary years. We had a Napoleon. And uh, so even though those two pulses were of completely equal amplitude, right? Most of us would have found the first one pretty annoying, and the second one completely relevant. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the basis on which ultrasonic teenage deterrent devices are, are, are done, unfortunately. You can target young people if you put annoying sounds in the frequency bands uh, that only young people can hear. Uh, dubious in my view, but um, ethically dubious, but that, that's what people do. Right? So the point is, it, it, only, it, only, it only affects you if you can perceive it. So to understand the effects, we need to understand the hearing of the, of the species that are potentially um, affected. And you can do this in two ways, right? Uh, one is if you've got a fairly clever animal that you can keep in captivity, you can train it to respond to, uh, uh, an act, to a, do a specific action when they hear a sound, okay? And I don't know how many people here have had their own hearing tested, and that's typically done using a behavioral response thing, right? You sit down and they say, press the button if you hear a sound, and they put the headphones on you, and that's, that's how you do it. Um, and, um, but you can also, you know, if your species is less amenable to training or, or anything like that, um, you can use electrophysiological methods uh, where you put electrodes next to the brain stem, uh, and, you, and you measure the small vol voltages that are generated by the brain in, in response to sound in the, in the auditory nervous system, okay? And then you do this at various sound levels to estimate the threshold, right? How loud does the sound have to be before you can hear it? And, and how does that change across different frequencies? Um, it'll be no surprise to know that with the behavioral responses where the animal is actually telling you what it can hear are much more sensitive uh, than the electrophysiological methods, mm -hmm. right? So that's the sort of the gold standard is to, is to get an animal and, and play some sounds to it and get it to tell you when it hears the sound. That's quite a challenging thing to do. For, I mean, it's impossible for larger animals like sperm whales and humpbacks. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that's just one of the, the challenges. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> when you uh, do this, for example, for humans, and you plot how sensitive our hearing is across different frequency ranges, you see that, that our, our hearing is maximally sensitive between about 1 and 10 kilohertz. And then it becomes increasingly less sensitive as you go above that, and we're not particularly good at hearing things at low frequency either. 
it's very tempting for us to just assume, well, if it annoys us, it must annoy other animals. If it doesn't annoy us, it mustn't annoy other species. But this, this audiogram, this line of auditory sensitivity, is very different for different species. For example, here's one for a cat. Okay? And it turns out that cats can hear at much higher frequencies than, than, than we can. So, so a noise that would have no impact on us at all could be very annoying for, for a cat. Right? <coughs> um, and in, in, in humans and any hearing species, there are thresholds above which um, we will experience pain, okay? and above which we, if we go even further than that, then we can uh, undergo some kind of injury as a result of having sound that is too loud. And obviously, understanding where those thresholds are, all three of these, the auditory threshold, the threshold of, sort of pain and the threshold of injury in different species at different frequencies is really, really important and really, really challenging. Okay, <clears throat> so let's think about what are the impacts of these sounds, right? What range of impacts do we expect to see? And there are a range of them, okay? Um, <clears throat> this, this is a report uh, from 10 years ago uh, when uh, a bunch of 40, almost 40 pilot whales um, stranded uh, in, in, in Scotland. <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, it was... Um, subsequently investigated and, and found to have been pretty clearly associated with some uh, bomb, bombing exercises that the Royal Navy were doing in the, in the area. Right? <coughs> so those explosions that I played to you earlier, pilot whales got too close to them, the pressure um, caused them somehow to become so disorientated they stranded and, and, and died. So, so the <coughs> you know, most severe impact is, is death. Uh, if you if you if you if the animals are too close to sounds that are too loud, they can become injured, incapacitated, disoriented, and end up uh, in a difficult situation like this. Okay, um, you can get physical injuries to your auditory systems. Okay, if you if you play too loud a song, if you're too, exposed to too loud a sound for too long, you get this thing called a permanent threshold shift, which means that that audiogram, that that line of sensitivity, uh, ends up shifting up and you become less able to hear. Your hearing is damaged, right? And it is damaged permanently. Um, we've probably all experienced a temporary threshold shift if we ever went to a loud concerts or, or anything like that, or you've been in, a, uh, in an area where there is a lot of loud noise. When you come out of it immediately, you've got this kind of slightly fuzzy hearing and you're not, you're not hearing so well. Okay, that's, that's a temporary threshold shift and you typically will recover over some period of time. But if you're a wild animal, who relies on echolocation, for example, to find your food, um, even the temporary threshold shift can have a significant impact on your ability to forage. Um, and then, of course, these animals are using sound for various reasons, either sensory, like their echolocation, or communicating with each other. Okay? And we, if that's the case, and there's other sounds impinging on your environment, then you can get this effect called masking. Right? And that means that's like... If I am standing next to a motorway uh, trying to talk to you, you're going to have a much harder time hearing me than you are in this quiet auditorium, right? If we went outside to the high street there, and we're all stood by where the traffic's going by, I'd have to talk a lot louder to, to get you to hear because my, my voice is being masked by the noise of the traffic. Right? So it can have impacts on the efficiency at which animals are able to echolocate or to communicate with each other. And then there are behavioural responses. Okay, uh, if I was to um, if I was to play that eight kilohertz tone that was really annoying to you continuously uh, in this room, most of you, after some period of time, would probably get up and leave. Okay, you would exhibit that behavioural response. You vacate the area. Um, we don't like to hang out close to sounds that are annoying, and neither does wildlife either. So we have these behavioural responses, and sometimes these behavioural responses can be so significant and dramatic that they actually lead to more serious consequences such as death and stranding, right? <clears throat> and we'll, we'll explore why in, in a minute. And then you can get other sort of um, uh, sub, what we call sublethal responses. And unsurprisingly, um, <clears throat> you know, these, for any given sound, okay, you'll, you can define a number of different zones based on how loud the sound is, how far away you are from it. So if you're too close to it, you know, injury and death are going to happen. 
um, there'll be a zone under which your use of sound will be affected by masking from that from that uh, source. Then uh, a larger area in which you might undergo some kind of behavioural response, right, I'm just going to move away from this or I'm going to change my behaviour in some way. And then there'll be some area where well, you can hear the thing, but it's really not bothering you. Right? So that's the zone of, of audibility. <coughs> so here's an example. Um, this is the, um, the, the Greek uh, coast, uh, Gulf on the, on, the, on the coast of Greece. And in 1998, on, on, on one particular um, day, uh, there were <coughs> six stranded beach whales showed up on this one beach. Okay? It never happened before, but it was coincident with a military exercise in the area, a NATO military exercise in, in that area. And this was the event that really sparked the whole deal of being suddenly uh, becoming aware and concerned about the impacts of noise on, on marine life. Okay, so this these these mass and um, very unusual and mass strandings uh, were almost certainly caused by the use of sonar during that military activity. The, the, the exact mechanism we still are not sure about, and there's been a lot of research done since then. Um, it's almost certainly not that these animals had their ears blown up by the sonar. It's almost Certainly because the um, sonar produced some kind of behavioral response in the animal that ended up with them becoming stranded. Okay? Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, these, these particular species of, of uh, a group called beaked whales that are known for diving to extreme depths, right? Several hundred meters, sometimes 2,000 or more meters down. And the pressures down there are really significant. Um, and if you get spooked or you, you don't control your diving properly, um, then uh, that can cause uh, decompression sickness, even in these whales, right? It can cause embolism, it can cause bubbles to appear in the bloodstream, and that can affect their cognition and their behavior, and it is thought that that is what the world is known stranding in, in this way, okay? So that was in 1998. Uh, two years later, um, <coughs> this is a sorry, very poorly labelled map of uh, deep water channel running through the Bahamas. Uh, this is um, a couple of the other code I am here. And again, uh, coincident with the passage of one vessel through this deep uh, channel, using this active sonar resulted in uh, uh, 14 animals ending up on the beach, right, after that had happened. So, <clears throat> uh, <coughs> You know, more than 10 beach whales stranded within a few hours over 10 of a short, you know, relatively restricted geographical areas, okay? Um, and when these two events happened, uh, there was some investigation done by the United States Marine Mammal Commission, uh, and they suddenly realized when they looked at when animals were stranding and when military exercises were happening that there was a very strong relationship between the two. All, all of these known cases involve, involve that mid-frequency 53 Charlie sonar that I played you earlier in the frequency range of 2 to 10 kilohertz. And perhaps significantly, that's a similar frequency range to uh, the, the one that is used by killer whales, which are a major predator of, of many whale species. So <clears throat> there's a, a, a very strong uh, um, idea going around that actually it's a behavioral response mediated by fear of a predator and mistaking the sonar for the sound of a killer whale. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this because it's some technical stuff about threshold shifting. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is very, uh, that I do want to make though, um, is that, you know, <clears throat> this is the definition of a permanent threshold shift. Uh, it's actually very difficult to study permanent, temporary and permanent threshold shifts, right? Because you have to induce them. You have to deliberately injure uh, people. So we, what we know about from humans comes from inadvertent exposure. So, so humans who were inadvertently exposed to high noise levels and then had their hearing measured afterwards, and we get some idea. But you can't do that systematically. You can't take a bunch of humans in and expose them to sound levels that you think will be injurious and then 
confirmed, yes, you really were injured. Congratulations. <laughs> your, your hearing is now damaged for life, okay? Um, back in the 1960s, when you could get away with a lot of stuff, people did this to cats, right? Uh, and that's the, pretty much the only experimental data we have about uh, hearing injury in, in mammals, right? We, we, we would not get permission to do that today. Don't worry, we're not going around blowing up cats ears. Um, but the point I want to make is that actually we have a lot of ignorance about how these injuries occur and what levels they do occur for obvious reasons, because it's pretty unethical to go around generating these injuries um, deliberately. Um, <clears throat> this is a kind of graphical illustration of this, this thing called masking that I talked about. Okay, um, So there's a lot of things going on in this diagram, but this dotted line here represents the sort of pristine state of the noise level, right? So there's, there's some noise level, and the, the pitch of it, and this is your ambient noise level, um, in, in the environment in which the animal perhaps evolved, okay? Uh, and you can see that if this is the energy of the call that it makes, then this difference here between the ambient noise level and the level of the call, this is the um, signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and it is the, the, the signal-to-noise ratio which defines when you can detect something, right? Because if the signal goes less than the noise, uh, then you can't hear it anymore, it just becomes part of the noise, you can't pull it out of the, the background, okay? Um, and then, okay, we come along and suddenly our ships start going in and we end up creating so much noise in this band that the animal is calling in, and the signal-to-noise ratio suddenly becomes much reduced, right? And that, that's, that's masking. And <clears throat> this is the, the technical graph, which gives rise to this image here, okay? which is um, a representation of um, what the, the, the area in which a blue whale call um, would exceed background noise, okay, if, the, if an animal here was localizing, in an undisturbed ocean. And this is the area that would be in with, with current, you know, today's shipping noise levels, right? So we have systematically and, and, and dramatically reduce the ranges of, over which these animals can communicate um, uh, with, um, and, 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 and it's thought that, especially in the North Atlantic, this may actually be impeding the recovery of the whale populations because they have to hear each other uh, in order to get together and mate and, and things like that. <coughs> the, the focusing on cetaceans here, um, because we know quite a lot about them, it's been, you know, we know that sound is important for them, we know they have sen sensitive hearing, so there's been quite a lot of study of that. Um, what they do when you sort of um, put them into um, noisy conditions uh, for whatever reason, and they actually have a number of strategies by which they can compensate for it, which is, which is good to know. Um, one thing is that if you're in a noisy environment, then you just talk louder, okay? We do this as well. It's called the Lombard effect. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're on a, if you're on a loud party, uh, you know, the house is full, everyone's talking away, you will talk louder because you want to be heard over that. Um, but we, we see this effect in right whales, for example, where they will increase the source level of their calls uh, if there's a lot of ships around. Uh, sometimes they can actually you know, shift their call frequency out of the noise, the, the frequency band that the noise is occurring. Right? If it's a narrow band uh, uh, noise source, um, then we have evidence from right whales and also belugas that they actually have some flexibility uh, and ability to sort of just shift out that frequency range. Right, so they shift the frequency of their calls. <coughs> they can only do that to some degree, right? <laughs> Obviously. Um, the other thing they can do is try and sort of increase the salience of the calls. So um, it's been shown that uh, when killer whale, when whale watching boats get close up to killer whales, they tend to increase the length of their calls. Right? They just make the calls longer and therefore make them more detectable. Um, or you can increase the redundancy of calls, right? So I can get my message across by saying the same thing multiple times. By saying the same thing multiple times, um, you, you end up uh, increasing the effectiveness of your communication. And this has been shown um, in, in response to humpback whales uh, in response to a different kind of naval sonar, a low frequency naval sonar. Uh, and, and it's been shown that uh, humpback songs, their humpbacks will actually increase the length of their songs 
and they're exposed to noise in order to try and uh, maximise their ability to get their message across. <coughs> um, so, so here's some data showing that in the right whales. Um, the other thing animals do is they just leave the area. Okay, so this is a, 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 an animal responding to a pinger, which is sometimes used to put on nets in order to try and deter animals from getting bite caught in those nets. Um, and we see that it's quite effective when, it's being, when the pinger is transmitting in uh, excluding porpoises from a particular area. Okay. <coughs> Here's the same thing. Uh, though, so what we see here are tracks of ray whales migrating uh, past a, 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 a peninsula in, uh, on the west coast of the US. And um, on the right are figures when there's been uh, there's an active noise source, and on the left are figures when there aren't an active noise source. And the point here is that behavioural change can be very context dependent. In this example, the noise source is right in the middle of their main migration path, and so they they go around it and they avoid it. Okay. Over here, it's placed further offshore, so actually it's outside of the main migration path, and you see a much smaller response. Right? So. Understanding the response to these animals is really, is really complicated, or can be quite complicated. So this is some of the research that was done after we realised that there was a big connection between naval exercises and, and uh, beak whales. And these are, this is the result of, of one, what's called a controlled exposure experiment, where you try and expose an animal um, that you've tagged so you know where it is, to a particular um, level of sound and try and then estimate what levels cause the responses. And so this is the ship, this is the sound source. It broadcasts sonar from uh, over a short period of time here. Uh, and um, <clears throat> here's the track of the whale during that period. Okay, so the yellow is pre exposure, it's kind of doing this. Uh, this area here is when the animal was exposed to sonar. And we see the post exposure pretty much directly, the animal takes off and, and just left the area. Yeah. So <clears throat> this, <laughs> this one piece of data here uh, probably costs several million dollars to, to collect because it involves multiple ships tagging an animal, uh, having a, 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 an actual military vessel there, making sonar in controlled ways, and then a research vessel tracking the, the ocean. So it, it, it's, it's not easy to get this data. In <clears throat> Even if animals don't leave, noise can still affect them. Uh, so this is a really interesting study uh, that um, was a inadvertent experiment that occurred on, on around these the 9/11 terrorist attacks in North America. One of the things that happened immediately after those attacks is that virtually all shipping traffic on the eastern seaboard of the United States was shut down. As part you know, all the planes were grounded, ships were um, required to go into port, okay? And this is the noise spectrum that was recorded during that period. The two lower lines in, in pink and orange are on September the 11th and September the 13th, so the two days immediately after those attacks. And the green and the blue are the August the 25th and August 29th, so just before, okay? And you will notice a dramatic drop in noise levels in the range of 50 to 150 hertz. That's because there were no ships going during those days. Okay. <coughs> now, these researchers happen to be out there um, uh, collecting fecal samples from right whales. Right? They, they like to do this, researchers. Because um, <clears throat> you can learn a lot of things from, from poop. But one of the things you can do uh, is measure stress hormone levels. Um, and <clears throat> what they did was, they, what they noticed was uh, that when they sampled in, uh, after 9-11 in 2001, uh, these uh, uh, glucocorticoid stress hormone levels were significantly reduced right, compared to the following years. Right? So even though the animals are still in the area, they're there because it's important habitat for them, they've been exposed to this shipping noise. It's only when we take it away and we see these, these stress levels go, these stress hormones go down, that we realise that our those, those, those that shipping noise is actually causing low-level chronic stress 
uh, to, to animals in this population. Uh, it's a very difficult effect to detect because you have to experimentally remove or take away the noise. And nobody's going to shut down the entire shipping uh, operations on the eastern seaboard of the US just because some scientist wants to find out about stress hormones and right whale poop, right? And it takes a major terrorist attack to, to, to have that happen. Um, <clears throat> so um, one silver lining from that terrible event is that we learned a little bit about you know, the effects that our activities are having on, on right whales in that area. And uh, research continues, and we continue to discover new effects, right? So, so, so here's a, a paper showing that um, uh, high, high levels of vessel noise disrupted foraging in wild harbor porpoises um, <clears throat> at, at received levels that are not very high, just 96 decibels, okay? It was, it was enough to, to induce a detectable drop in prey capture attempts. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we see that um, uh, dives and surface intervals all tend to become longer during mid-frequency sonar use. That's part of that, that data I showed earlier, contributed to um, uh, uh, this, this, this result. <coughs> and um, <coughs> these scientists showed that uh, humpback whale song occurrence was reduced um, uh, Concurrent with transmissions of, a, of a, actually a, a, an acoustic experiment, ocean acoustic waveguide remote sensing experiment. Um, so it turns out that you can measure temperature changes in the ocean by broadcasting low frequency sound through it. Uh, and this is being used by many oceanographers, or, or in, in many cases, to, um, to measure the effects of climate change and things like that. But it's also introducing noise into the environment. And this had a, had a detectable effect on humpback song behavior at a range of 200 kilometers. Mm. So, <clears throat> that's noise, okay. Now I've talked a lot about whales and marine mammals, you know, big, uh, lovely animals that we all, um, very endearing to us, but actually there's a growing uh, and, and, and quite significant body of research uh, that is showing how, well, animals that are not traditionally known for their use of sound or their detectability of sound, like scallops, um, are being can be significantly affected by uh, anthropogenic noise. Okay, so so this study showed that scallop larvae that were exposed to playbacks of seismic survey pulses, so those ones that I showed you that were per permeating the North Atlantic, those those regular pulses, um, showed significant developmental delays, and 46% of the larvae study developed body or abnormalities. Right. Um, <clears throat> With these effects observed in all samples exposed to noise, while no malformations were found in control groups, and they looked at nearly 5,000 larvae in, in this experiment. Right? So there's an emerging story about other animal groups, invertebrates, and especially the larvae of, of, of these animal defensive species, having quite significant sensitivity and, 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 and bad effects of noise. Okay, I'm getting to the end. I promise you. How do we measure the impact of noise? Um, we can measure uh, uh, individual responses, and um, obviously we can't experimentally induce death, that's unethical, uh, but we have some idea from humans who, who have accidentally been exposed, right, they've, they've, got, they've had an exposure event by accident, that can tell us a little bit about what kind, when we might expect to see these effects. Um, there are some captive experiments that have induced temporary threshold shift for the permanent stressful shift, again, we still have to just extrapolate from humans. Behavioral responses, that we can study, okay, by various means, um, including experiments at sea. Um, but it's very difficult to interpret these behavioral changes because they're context dependent. <laughs> they depend on the motivation, right? If you're really hungry, you're probably going to tolerate more noise when you're at a, at a rich food patch than you would if you weren't hungry. Right? You just go, oh, no, I'm not, I don't care about these fish, I'm, gonna leave. I'm not that hungry. You also have these behavioural effects over time. Habituation, where a response can decline over time as you get more used to it, just doesn't bother you anymore. But you can also get sensitised to it, right? We've all got sounds that we get sensitised to, I think. Um, uh, nails down backboards and things like that. The more you hear it, the more annoying it is. 
that sensitization. Um, and you can, you can have animals that will tolerate significant <coughs> noise levels because they really want to be in a place, right? So, so if you go and put a lot of noise into a breeding ground, for example, you may find the animals show no detectable behavioral response. They just tolerate it because they've got to be there. If they're not there, they don't breed, and that's you know, no good. <coughs> right? Um, so, for example, uh, somewhere close to home here, uh, these are the uh, wind farms, Beatrice and, and Murray East, that, are, that, have, that have been constructed over the past uh, few years. Uh, and colleagues out of the University of Aberdeen um, use something called uh, passive acoustic monitoring, which is where you just listen for the sounds of animals of interest, of species of interest, in this case, the harbor porpoise. Uh, and they were able to show that uh, even these two wind farms, they deployed acoustic devices to monitor the presence uh, and habitat use uh, of harbor porpoises in this area. Okay, um, so, so if you hear their clicks, you know they're there. And if you hear them doing a particular pattern of clicks called buzzes, you know that they're foraging. Right? So both of these can be monitored using power. Uh, and then <coughs> they showed that there was uh, that, that piling activity that we, I played you sounds of before uh, induced a broad scale behavioral response. The animals vacated the area to a range of 12 kilometers from the sand source. So they just cleared out during that period when the piling was going on, okay? Um, <clears throat> although, <coughs> uh, but then when that piling was done, they came back. <laughs> and they continued to use the sites during the construction period after that piling noise uh, had stopped, right? So the animals have some behavioral flexibility. If we, if we measure it and we monitor it, we can see what effects they were having. In this, in this case, we, we were able to, to understand that there, there was an effect, but that it was temporary. The animals didn't permanently leave, leave the habitat. Right? They left it while there was a noise, and they came back when the noise stopped. The challenge that we have is understanding how these short-term behavioral changes integrate and aggregate over longer periods to affect or not affect the vital rates and, and the popula like population growth rate survival, maturation, and reproduction in these populations, okay? And that's a big challenge <coughs> that the field is kind of wrestling with right now. <coughs> um, and I'm just going to finish off by picking up a colleague here who's going to talk to you about um, a study that they did looking at this question of whether killer whale sounds and sonar sounds have a similar effect on, on, on a species, a vulnerable species of interest, right? <laughs> Research Fellow at the Center for Research into Ecological and Environmental Modeling, um, CREAM at the University of St. Andrews, but I also work at the Sea Mammal Research Unit at, SMU at the Scottish Oceans Institute. I work a lot on different uh, marine renewable projects, especially offshore wind, so looking at the impacts of underwater noise, especially on marine mammals. But also now, um, in the past year, I've also learned more about seabirds and how offshore wind might be affecting seabirds. This paper was part of the um, 3S project, uh, which stands for Sea Mammals, Sonar and Safety Project. We conduct controlled exposure experiments on tagged animals in the wild. So we go and put a suction cup tag on say sperm whales, we leave them be for four hours and then we expose them to controlled levels of sonar and this is so that we can understand the kind of safe levels of receipt levels on animals which can then inform uh, mitigation uh, strategies for different navies around the world, so US, France, the Netherlands and so on. So for this paper we were particularly interested in whales that keep going foraging throughout the sonar exposures. So they sometimes stop foraging, move away, and so there's quite a clear response, but other times the animals just seem to be um, going. So they echolocate, 
they do these buzzing sounds that indicate that they are still trying to capture prey. But there is this and sonar going on in the background, so we were interested whether they are still successful in capturing prey or whether their echolocation might be masked uh, by the sonar. This now. <laughs> so the uh, data loggers that we use are sound and movement tags and so we get uh, movement behavior so dive depth but also like the 3D orientation, pitching, heading and um, fluking behavior. And concurrently the uh, recorders are also recording sound and so we get these echolocation sounds detected. And for the masking question, we also wanted to have some indicators of how loud the ambient noise environment is, um, because not only is there sonar, but there's also natural variation, the variation in the background levels. One big contributor to this is CSET, and so we collect as part of our visual surveys of how big a sea state there is. We used those visual recordings as well as the animal attached data logger recordings together to try to understand if the animals are behaving differently in this different ambient noise and sonar condition. So um, we discovered it's challenging. <laughs> And basically, auditory masking is really um, challenging to detect in nature because there are all these different variables. So, for example, if you are facing a sound source, you'll be impacted by it much more than if you're facing a wave. Thankfully, we have data for that. So, as the animal is facing the sea surface, we expect it to be more affected by sea surface noise than facing away. Similarly, facing towards sonar, we expect a greater received level than facing away. So we were looking for these indicators. Is the animal turning away from the sonar and keeping going? We didn't find very um, strong indications of this. The small patterns that we did find was a reduced buzzing, basically, at shallow waters facing towards sea surface, kind of indicating that maybe they are either the prey is there or they don't attempt to capture prey when it's very noisy. In a way, it wasn't unexpected that we didn't find um, strong indications of masking. We did find the animals um, um, ceased foraging, um, but that was something we knew from previous work already, that there were some animals that just stopped foraging and uh, did something else. Well, we communicate these results directly to the different navies. They are specifically interested in the kind of received levels of sound at which we start seeing effects. Because then when they do their exercises, they can uh, keep at a certain maximum level and they can also estimate every five years, I think they have this big cycle of when they need to estimate <coughs> how many animals might be impacted behaviorally as they do their operations at different parts of the world. The 3S project is an international consortium consisting of loads of people from different countries. So the PIs of the project are Peter Kvartsveen from Norway, from <coughs> Peter Lam from TNO in the Netherlands, and Patrick Miller from the Seaman Research Unit in St Andrews. But there's um, many people involved, again, from the different countries where the navies come from. So it's a big team, um, a huge team on the field, um, but also on this paper to get all this data analysed. alluded to there was, was this problem, you know, there's a, a, a large knowledge gap understanding the impact of the activity in the context of all the other factors, all the other stresses in the environment, um, but there's an increasing demand for this to be part of environmental impact assessments, um, specifically the acoustic uh, impacts. Um, and so what Sana really brought home there, I think, is A, how challenging it is to get this information from, from animals in the wild, and the kind of scale of research activity yeah, international consortiums that need to be brought together to, to try and understand this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's me. I'm sorry, I've, I've slightly overstayed my welcome. Um, <clears throat> I hope I didn't bore you too much.
thank you. That, I think it was most fascinating and also quite alarming. <laughs> um, I should have said before that there is actually some material outside on machine matters which you're welcome to collect when you when you leave. Um, any questions for 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 look here? Oh, question. Okay, I, um, I think you said that um, there was some international control of noise limits and so on. I just wonder, for example. Presumably there must be standards um, in place for different activities for shipping, for drilling, and so on. And, and um, I mean, to what extent um, are these effective? You know, are, are, are sort of standards being um, driven up? Um, and, um, and who inspects these things? Um, yeah, so the question is, you know, how is this being regulated in, in, internationally? There, there is no international agreement at all about it. Um, it's all about individual countries becoming concerned about animals that in their own jurisdiction are being affected. So for example, there's a lot of research being funded by the US on the effect of noise on right whales because they're an endangered species and, and uh, there's lots of sort of legal um, triggers in the, in the United States system in the Marine Mammal Protection Act that they have over there that brings in uh, uh, activities there. But there's, there's no international agreement I thought you said that the EU has a... Um, um, so, well, okay, so the, 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 yes, the, the Marine Strategies Framework Directive within the European Union um, does include noise levels as an indicator of good environmental health, right? So, so uh, countries within the EU are being required to monitor and report noise levels as part of their reporting of their environmental status. And so, yes, you're right, there is that, that one, but that's the only one that I'm aware of that's, that's transnational. That consortium that Sanon was part of is also part of that. That's probably not 100% sure, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's under the auspices of NATO because it's a military cooperation involved. And what about, what about shipbuilders? I mean, do, do they just ignore it? Or, or? Uh, well, no, there are, um, there are um, various things in progress that are aimed at reducing the issues of, of ship noise. Um, one thing that, and, and that's usually done through an organization called the IMO, or the International Maritime Organization. Um, so once you build a ship, it is what it is. It's going to make the noise that it makes as it goes through the ocean, right? But you can significantly, if you reduce speed from 20 knots to 10 knots, um, you take almost 20 decibels off that ship's noise level, so you halve it, right? You halve the speed, you halve the, the noise. Um, of course, that upsets people because their Amazon packages <coughs> longer to, to, to arrive, and shipping shipping companies often, often want you know, their ships to go as fast as they were designed to go. So um, in in some cases, you can, you can have speed restrictions which are aimed at reducing the risk of ships actually hitting animals, but they also have the pleasant side effect of reducing the noise levels as well. But it's quite a big thing to our shipping companies. Can I ask how it's really how it's policed? It isn't. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said back how you know someone is impossible to believe. Yeah, uh, in, 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 you know, uh, but but to be to be honest, ship captains are pretty good if you get it into the system that the IMO operates that says okay, you know, and they'll have it on their chart and it'll say reduce speed area or something like that, and, and they just they just have to, you know they they follow it um, by by and large. But the real, the real um, solution to this is going to be in quieting technologies on ships. So, so there is research and efforts going in as you build new ships to, to make them quieter as quiet as possible. Because the sound goes out, that's, that's lost energy for the ship as well. Right? It's a waste of energy to, to, to put sound energy out from the ship. So if you do less, then you waste less energy. Um, but yeah. Question over here from... It, it, it used to be said that Britain had the quietest propellers in the world, the Russians had the noisiest, and the Americans are in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously the best propellers are top secret, but there is, is there any move to make the second best propellers available for merchant ships? <laughs> um, yes, there are. There, there's, 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 I'm not super familiar with it, so I can't give you a great deal of detail, but I do know, uh, because I've seen the, the, the advertisement for the various meetings that have been going on, that there's active attempts to um, quieten ship 
Ships, technology. Moving military technology into the civilian sphere. Um, yes, and absolutely, that, that would be a, that, that's one way to do it. On, on that, I, re I remember being told that I think Navy ships have an, an odd number of blades and commercial or the other way around had even, and I wondered... Um, you got me there, I don't know. <laughs> <why I don't laughs> know. Um, Sorry. Um, both designers thought they were right, I think. Question. In the uh, compensatory mechanisms in Wales that you told us about, yes, yes. Is that learned behaviour? Would a, would a calf have to learn that from the mother or the pod, or is it innate? Is it an evolutionary mechanism? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question, uh, and, I, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, to be honest, I, I doubt it's an evolutionary response, because you know, while there are natural background noises, you know, things like earthquakes and, 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 and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> Right at the beginning of the talk, I talked about this little notch in the ambient noise at 100 hertz, and the, the evolution response is that a lot of whales have, have targeted that notch for their own signals. Okay, but shipping and, and the, the levels that we're talking about today has only just been around for less than 100 years, so there's no time for the evolution response to kick in. So a lot of this, I suspect, is going to be learned. I, I don't know. Trial and error, I suppose. Question at the back. Yes. Do you think marine animals go deaf? Sorry? <laughs> do you think marine animals actually can go deaf? Yes, absolutely, yes. yes. Do that, is it the same hearing system or do they have a completely different one? No, no, it's, 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 uh, it, it's very related to ours. Uh, it, it, well, the marine mammals, obviously. Um, fish and invertebrates and things like that will be completely different. But, um, but cetaceans and seals, whales and dolphins, they have mammalian ears, uh, just like us, so they, they have cochlea and they have um, you know semicircular canals and, and, and uh, yeah it's 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 it evolutionarily homolog homologous they took their terrestrial ears back into the sea uh, with them. What they do have that's a little bit different um, is that they have uh, ways of transmitting sound that's impinging on their bodies to the ears um, because obviously um, uh, you know, the, the air and water interface is pretty bad. So, so for example, both of those dolphins have an area in their lower jaw called the pan bone, which is an area where the bone is a bit rarefied and it has uh, and it's in, invested with um, lipids, uh, so fatty substances that are quite good at receiving and transmitting sound. Uh, and so they can actually sound can impinge upon their jaw, and there are channels that direct it up to the ear for, for detecting. They have slightly different systems, but the basic hearing mechanism is the same as us, which is why we can do things like extrapolate from, from human injury levels and think about, well, okay, maybe this, this is what would injure or will, will cause an animal to go deaf. Uh, but if you're an echolocating odontocy and you go deaf, then that's, that's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Question: We've seen there isn't any sort of international cooperation to reduce noise. Is that something that could happen? Like, is there an appetite for that, or like to be part of the COP discussion? Or not really. Um, I, I don't think it's been part of the the, the, the COP discussion. I, I am aware of a number of meetings <laughs> that have been held um, along the idea of a sort of an international um, uh, an, an international quiet ocean experiment, which is where there's an attempt to gather up enough countries to say, okay, on, on this particular period of time, right, we're, we're going to do like like the US did in, in, after 9-11, we're just going to not do any shipping. <coughs> we're just going to try and not put any noise in the ocean and see what happens, right? see what it sounds like, and see if we can detect any changes in the animal behavior. We thought we might have done that naturally during COVID, but actually the pattern of shipping change over COVID was very complicated because obviously there's a lot more good, yeah, actually there's a significant amount of, of commerce going on and everyone was doing their online shopping and stuff like that. So in some areas it went down, in some areas it went up. So we couldn't have that sort of control experiment. At the back here. Um, is there any evidence of noise having permanent um, effects on migration and breeding patterns? Um, effect on migration and breeding patterns. Um, 
I, I'm not sure, actually. I, I, I don't think there is hard evidence. Um, but that may be a function of just how hard it would be to sort of study the migration of an entire population and then how it's being affected by, by noise and things like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that, that right whales that migrate from sort of waters off Florida up to um, Nova Scotia and St. Lawrence down the eastern seaboard, they've been described as, a, as the urban whale because they go through such an industrialized mm -hmm. seascape. Um, but they still keep doing it. <laughs> if you have to migrate to breed, it's going to take a lot to stop you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we don't really understand the factors that drive migration in, in, in the first place in, in, in many cases. So um, I'm not aware, you know, probably you, you, would, you would get these temporary movements like with the harbour boxes and, and the, and the, and the um, construction wind farms and things like that. I'm not aware of any evidence of the Question, Tom? Yes. yes. So when we advertised your talk on Facebook, there was almost immediately a comment from a lady who was uh, saying that, well, noise can't be a problem because dolphins appear to love it. They're attracted to ships. So, right. yeah, so I have no idea, but what's going on with dolphins? Are they, are they actually enjoying the noise of ships? They appear to be attracted. What's happening with dolphins when they follow a ship? Yeah, okay, so so two things. One, one is um, <laughs> we have to think about the frequencies, the pitches of the, the noise and, and where the dolphins are, are sensitive. So I don't remember when I played you the sound dolphins, mm. pretty high pitched, right? Mm. So a lot of their activity, their echolocation, the mean frequency of their echolocation clicks is actually 120 kilohertz, which is like six times higher than we can hear completely ultrasonic. We, we hear the low frequency mm -hmm. sidebands of it, but that's just like, you know, that's not where the main action is. The, the peak is at 120 kilohertz. And their whistles are up at sort of 10, 12, up to 20, 25 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. um, whereas shipping noise <laughs> is almost all of below one kilohertz. So in that case, the frequencies are separated and shipping noise, we don't think has, you know, or, or it can be tolerated much more mm. by, by bottomless dolphins. And what they're attracted by is the pressure wave, you know, they like to bow, right? <laughs> yeah. So the pressure wave of the bow of the ships is what, is what brings them in. Um, <clears throat> but it is possible, you know, <clears throat> analogize, for example, um, <clears throat> as a young man, I often went to concerts and sometimes I stayed too close to the speakers in those concerts because um, <laughs> there was quite a nice girl that I was talking to, <laughs> close to or shouting at, yeah. <laughs> maybe the speakers. And I wanted to be there because of that. I probably induced a temporary threshold shift and a little bit of hearing damage because of that, but, but the interaction between motivation and noise <laughs> is, is, yeah. is, is a complicated one. So just because an animal is there when there's a noise occurring doesn't mean it's not having an effect of not damaging it there because they could be extremely motivated to be there for other reasons and, and tolerate that. Um, that. Yeah, thank you. Gentlemen in the third row, you've been asking to try and try yeah, a question for a while. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the noise um, contributions that you've discussed, the, uh, the shipping, the wind farms, etc., uh, um, um, very continuous type sounds. So, yeah. um, in air, we can use noise cancellation. Uh, yes. Is that possible to be used in, um, in, in, um, in water? Yeah. I, I, so the one mitigation that I have seen being used is this uh, it, a, a bubble net, actually. So um, that is used in some cases where piling is being done in, in particularly sensitive areas. You sort of put a hose on the seabed and around where you're going to do the piling, and then it produces this sort of wall of bubbles, and that will disrupt the transmission of the sound. So it is a mitigation strategy that can be used if you know that the sound is going to be in a particular place. Um, you can sort of have this double net around it. Yeah, so you're talking about like noise cancellation, yeah. where you do yeah. a, a negative wave to... Yeah, the so <coughs> I, I, I think that works like if you could put a set of headphones on all the animals. <laughs> it, it doesn't work as a sort of point source. You can't broadcast a canceling yeah. sound yeah. at the same time as, a, as, the, as, the, as the other sound. Noise canceling headphones work by listening to what you're receiving at your ear and then kind of doing yeah. cancelling that out. So yeah, unless you can instrument every animal. <laughs> yeah. 
opened up that not necessarily going to work. But you, there are some cases where you, things like double nets and you know, that, again, an active area of research because mm -hmm. that, that helps. Okay. David. Thinking about the problem of military sonar, mm -hmm. and especially active sonar, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that most navies now are very, very reluctant to use active sonar because you give away your own position to the enemy before you actually find the enemy. So I wonder if um, it's a problem that may to some extent self-cancel. Uh, yeah, um, th there isn't, well, I mean, obviously I'm not party to the secret um, things that are, that, that are going on. Um, however, uh, yeah, so, so you know, the, you can have this passive sonar where mm. what you're doing is you're as quiet as you possibly can, you listen as hard as you can. That's what they do now. Sound of, of, of this kind of thing. Um, but um, <clears throat> if active sonar works, then it's fantastic because you find out where the, the, the animal is. So, mm. so I'm not, you know, I think active sonar is going to be with us for, 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 for quite some time. Um, but. Um, we can hope that maybe the quieting technologies that are obviously very important to navies for their submarines and their ships to be as quiet as possible to avoid being detected by passive sonar, mm. um, that, that may lead to developments in, in, in civilian life. Um, but but um, yeah, no, no, I, I think there's um, nations around the world are all trying to develop active sonar. I think active sonar is going to be with us. Um, if there are well oh sorry sorry I was kind of I mean it's relation to Wayne but do any do the, the noises that, that we're talking about in the in the ocean and the magnitudes and stuff do they in your to your knowledge or experience do they result in the damage to internal organs of, of uh, cetacea or fish or whatever it is um, generally no I, I would say, I mean, they can if you're right next to an explosion, but the damage is done by the pressure wave mm -hmm. right, rather than necessarily the sound. And I guess mm -hmm. we're focusing on here on sounds that are being either the auditory system. When I talk about injury, I think about, you know, yeah. you, you, the damage to the auditory system, mm -hmm. and then behavioral responses are all mitigated through that auditory thing. If you, obviously, if you put an animal next to a, a big explosion or something, yeah. it's going to suffer damage, but it won't be an acoustic thing as much as it is just an explosive thing. So. Okay. What what can happen? Sorry, just <laughs> to go on that way. Um, uh, is that when you talk about those deep diving animals and things like that, if they get freaked out because they mistake a sonar for a bunch of killer whales chasing them down, and they are less careful about their ascents and descents during their diving, then you can get internal damage from um, from from embolism from from, from the bends, different from versions of the bends. Will, that, that can cause internal damage. Okay. But again, that's a behavioural response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, pass over to Colin for his good report. Thanks. Yes. Well, it's been a really fascinating talk. Uh, I think we, we all had a little bit of an idea of what sort of marine noise, cetaceans, and other creatures had to face. I don't think any, any of us really had uh, an, an idea of the range of, of noises and the type of effects that they had, uh, and we had some examples of how it's like to be a, a marine creature through some of the, the recordings that we heard. It's quite sobering to think that virtually all the anthropogenic noise has uh, originated just in the last hundred years or so, uh, and uh, uh, that's just, just no more than two or three generations for many of these very long-lived creatures. Uh, but then and also quite interesting actually that some of the, the compensatory responses are not that dissimilar to birds living in, in noisy environments and that they, they sing louder or they sing longer or choose different times of day so, uh, so some of the, the findings I think have wide, wider applicability mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly been a very entertaining uh, way to to present the rather depressing subjects. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I speak to the speaker in the usual way.